Welcome to our worship services, uh, our virtual worship services this morning, pleasant parishioners. We are thankful, we are thankful, we are thankful that you uh, are tuning in. We're just going to give you just a moment because I know we are in virtual world and in virtual land. We're just going to give you a moment to come on in, come on in, come on in. If you're coming in, give us an emoji or give us a heart, give us a hand. Uh, just let us know that you are uh, present with us virtually. If you're present with, with us virtually, just let us know. Amen. Amen. We're just going to give a moment or two. We're going to give a moment or two uh, to allow you all to come in. We're so thankful. Brothers and sisters, I know we, I know we are tired of COVID. If you're tired of COVID, why don't you just raise your hand? If you you tired of COVID, just raise your hand. You know we're tired of COVID, but one thing about it, COVID is not tired of us. So we've uh, come to a place and a time where brothers and sisters, uh, where we're trying to respond as uh, a responsible church. Uh, we don't want anyone to um, get sick. Uh, and possibly uh, even worse because of this COVID season. Uh, so we decided collectively as leadership that we would be in virtual worship uh, uh, until the end of January. But brothers and sisters, thank you. Come on in, come on in. Uh, those of you who are still logging in, we just want to give you just a little bit of time uh, to log in. I got my little helper with me today. I hope you all don't mind. And what she's going to do, uh, she's going to help daddy call us into worship. Amen. The word of God says, train up a child in the way that they should go, because when they become older, they will not depart from it. So we want to allow her this opportunity uh, to uh, engage in worship uh, and engage in our virtual worship services. Come on, somebody say amen, pleasant parishioners. I, I, I yearn for the day that we are back in person with each other, but let's stay connected. Let's stay connected virtually uh, as we wait on that time. Amen, amen, amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord punch an emoji. Amen, 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 amen. So at this time, brothers and sisters, um, we... Uh, we are a few minutes in, so we want to uh, allow little Avery to call us into worship as she reads Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside me. Quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path. Paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows only good and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Amen. Thank you, little Avery. Uh, thank you for calling us into worship. Amen. You have been called into worship. We are thankful uh, for you, uh, brothers and sisters, we want to pause now for a word of prayer. God, now we thank you for who you are. We thank you uh, 
uh, for your presence and we thank you for your power. God, we thank you for even the babes who lift up and magnify your name. God, we thank you for each pleasant parishioner wherever they are. God, we pray that you don't allow your church to become scattered uh, because of these circumstances that are beyond our control. God, we ask right now that you be a God who stretches our faith and matures us in our understanding. God, we ask that you have mercy upon Pleasant Green and help us to understand that the heyday is not behind us, but it's before us. God, in the name of Jesus, we ask that uh, someone gets clarity on their purpose today. And Lord God, we pray now that uh, you visit us in whatever, wherever we are in whatever capacity that we serve. God, we ask that you bless each of our leaders today. God, we thank you uh, for our ministers, each and every one of them. God, we thank you for our deacons, each and every one of them. And God, we thank you for our trustees, each and every one of them. God, now we we pray that we do what is pleasing in the sight of God. And God, we pray now that you lead us and guide us and push us to the place uh, where you would have us to be. God, we ask that uh, this worship, um, this virtual worship service, uh, it proves to be meaningful in someone's life. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let us all say, amen, 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 amen. If you would, princess, pretty girl, would you take this microphone and go on over there by mama and be my amen corner? Amen, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Brothers and sisters, uh, we are about to jump into the word of God. We are about to jump into the word of God. We want to uh, go uh, to Mark, Mark, the fourth chapter. Um, I'm probably, I probably should take it easy a little bit. Uh, this, um, the worship over the wire this morning at 830 got me so excited um, that I probably aggravated my laryngitis. So, brothers and sisters, we may take it a little bit easier than we did uh, this morning. Uh, so, if you would follow me uh, to the fourth chapter, and brothers and sisters, uh, we want to jump into the Word of God. Man, just a moment. Amen. I'm going to give you a moment or two. Amen. Amen. We want to give you just a moment or two. Excuse me. Mark. Mark the fourth chapter. Mark the fourth chapter. And brothers and sisters, we'll be reading 35 through 41. 35 through 41. 35 through 41. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Um, so mine may read just a little bit differently from yours. Um, so there we will find the word uh, that will come to us um, like this. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they, they took Jesus in the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. 
The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, and many of your Bibles may say master, may say Lord, don't you care that we are going to drown? The King James Version said, don't you care if we're about to perish? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence or peace, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. They asked the question, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Brothers and sisters, for the time that we share together, I just want to use as a subject storm survivors, storm survivors. Um, I know that during this COVID season, um, through whatever season that you experience in life, I think all of us, if we have made it to where we are now and we are still and yet alive, we can without a doubt say that we are storm survivors. We are storm survivors. We are storm survivors. Brothers and sisters, I'm reminded of years ago, uh, Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina uh, came ashore Monday, uh, uh, the August 29th, uh, 2005. Uh, it was one of the five most deadliest as well as the most costliest hurricanes in the history of the United States. It caused destruction all over the Gulf Coast from Central Florida all the way to Texas. The most severe damage occurred, as we all know, in New Orleans, Louisiana, which flooded uh, as the levee system uh, catastrophically failed. As a result, there were more than one million internally displaced persons from the Gulf States region. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, a debate began after the news media referred to those who had to abandon their homes and cities as what was called refugees. On Friday, September the 2nd, 2005, the Congressional Black Caucus held a news conference at the National Press Club Representative Carolyn Kilpatrick, one who was from Detroit, she shared with us, please do not call them refugees because they are not refugees. These people are not refugees. As a matter of fact, she says that they are American citizens. Vigorous debates began among editors and journalists and brothers and sisters, the whole thing about it was that they were arguing that these people were not refugees. Uh, but if you follow me, they would ask them to refer to them uh, with a more precise, with more precise language. They asked them that, uh, hey, would you refer to them uh, as uh, evacuees, uh, um, and because uh, a refugee, brothers and sisters, is not 
uh, the right term because a refugee is one who is fleeing from a political persecution. And they were certainly not doing that. They were called evacuees again, but that still does not speak to the scope of their plight and problem. They were without a doubt storm survivors. They not only had to come to uh, a storm, they had not only come to a storm, but they had come through a storm. And I know some people, and there are no some pastors, and I know some parishioners, uh, along with some saints and servants who uh, would, I would call storm survivors in that we have been through some things in the last year. We have experienced some stuff in the last year. And brothers and sisters, we are storm survivors. Not because we have uh, survived the storms of nature, but because we have survived the storms of life. And brothers and sisters, sometimes we are survivors of storms, not because of the wind and the rain that falls upon us, but we are survivors because we have survived in life and what life throws at us. If you've ever had to survive when your month was longer than your money, then you are a survivor. If you've ever had to survive hell in your own family or ruptures in your relationships, then brothers and sisters, you are a storm survivor. If you've had to face health issues and you didn't know if you were going to make it through, brothers and sisters, you are a storm survivor. And one of the things that I would share with you is that uh, the storm that you face may not have uh, been issued or covered on CNN, or it may not have made uh, USA Today. It may not have made the St. Louis Dispatch, but brothers and sisters, your storm is just as real, and we are thankful that you have made it through. As we read Mark, the fourth chapter, uh, 35th through the 41st verse, you will discover that storms are not predictable. As a matter of fact, the writer says that there arose a great storm. The phrase suggests that the storm came unexpectedly. And isn't that how it is in life? that storms many times comes expectedly, un unexpectedly. Storms comes when we least expect it. As we take a look at the uh, geography of the area, the Sea of Galilee lies 680 feet below sea level. It is surrounded by hills, especially on the east side where it was 2,000, over 2,000 feet high. These heights are a source of cool and dry air. Often the cool air descending from the hills will collide with hot air and it is ascending, causing storms to manifest itself in a very instant way. In other words, brothers and sisters, because of the geography, uh, storms would arise in a very instant way. Life is often how that happens. Before you know it, brothers and sisters, you are in a storm. If you understand how life works, sometimes, brothers and sisters, we can be up one day and down the same day. One phone call away will place us in a storm. One email away will place us 
in a storm. One trip to the doctor will place us in a storm. And suddenly you are in a storm. Brothers and sisters, what I'm suggesting to you is that storms are unpredictable. As a matter of fact, we all know that a hymn that says time is filled with swift transitions. Brothers and sisters, storms are unpredictable. But brothers and sisters, what I stop through to share with you today is that although they are unpredictable, storms are extremely purposeful. They are purposeful for us as believers because it is in the storms of life that God measures our faith. I want somebody to understand that you are not facing these troubles and these trials just haphazardly. God is stre stretching and measuring your faith. As we look at verse 40, after Jesus had calmed the storm, he asked the disciples, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have absolutely no faith after experiencing everything that I have done for you? Brothers and sisters, what I always share with the pleasant parishioners and partners of PG is that storms will reveal whether we are living in fear or whether we are living in faith. Fear is a state of anxiety. An alarm and brothers and sisters and angst and brothers and sisters fear uh, is due to an expectation of harm. If brothers and sisters, if we live in a level of fear, we expect something bad to happen. But faith involves complete reliance upon God to do what God said God would do in every situation. I wish I had some help in here, brothers and sisters, as we look at the text, we understand that we must either come to the storm in fear or we must come to the storm with a level of faith. Let me calm down so my laryngitis will go away. In the book, in his book, uh, The Meaning of Faith, the late Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick says, fear imprisons, faith liberates. Let me say that again. Fear imprisons, but faith liberates. Fear paralyzes and faith empowers. Fear dishardens and faith encourages. Fear sickens and faith heals. Fear is useless, but faith makes serviceable. Brothers and sisters, I wish we were in the church today. I would holler and say, brothers and sisters, what will you do? Use fear or faith. The only way to survive your storm is by placing your faith and complete reliance in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one who can handle our storms. The passage presents and pinpoints the place of our reliance if we are to be storm survivors. Brothers and sisters, if you are to be a storm survivor, there are a few things that I want to share with you. Well, number one, the first thing that I want to share with you, if you are to be a storm survivor, you are to rely on God's promise. Rely on God's promise. Rely on God's promise. If you are going to hold on to your faith while you're going through your storm, you must rely on God's promise. When Jesus says, let us cross over to the other side, he stated it in the subjective mood, which means that the statement was an imperative. In other words, 
it was not a suggestion, but Jesus was saying this as a command. He was saying, let us go over to the other side. It was not something that he was suggesting for us to do, but this is what the Lord was commanding us to do. It was not a proposition, but it was a promise. Brothers and sisters, in essence, Jesus was saying, come what may, we are going over to the other side. In other words, what he was saying, I don't care what hell or high water we face together, we are going over to the other side. Indeed, brothers and sisters, the storms of life may come, but there is no way uh, to go under when the Lord is telling us to go over. I want to say that again. It, it, it is no way for us to go under when the Lord has already proclaimed for the pleasant parishioners, partners of PG and all believers that we must go over. We can't go under if God has promised us that we're going to go over. When Jesus says something, we can count on it. We can take it to the bank. Sometimes storms come and we have a tendency to forget what the Lord has promised. But he has said that it, it, when God says it, it settles it. Brothers and sisters, we must remember that life's problems do not preclude the Lord's promises. The truth is, I wish I could hear present parishioners in call in response today, but the truth is that the Lord, the life's uh, problems can become our uh, preparation to the Lord's promises. Brothers and sisters, I want to say that again. Sometimes a life's problems, life's problems can become preparation uh, to the Lord's promises. Brothers and sisters, this was certainly true in the life of Abraham. You all remember the life of Abraham, don't you? All of my Bible scholars, all of my pleasant parishioners who continue to read their Bible, God had made Abraham a promise. I'm going to make you a seed, your seed to outnumber the stars in the sky. I'm going to make your seed to outnumber the sands on the beach. Uh, but brothers and sisters, before he got to the promise, he had a problem. Brothers and sisters, before he ever experienced the provisions of God, he experienced the problem. Abraham encountered the same problems that we even encounter today. He in encountered folks lying, lying problems. He encountered Family problem. I'm about to shout in here by myself. He encountered aging problems. And brothers and sisters, it was not until he was 100 years old that he was able to have a son. So what I'm sharing with you that even the very elect of God have experienced problems. Then Abraham received a message from God to take his only son, and sacrifice him. That's a problem. Uh, that, that's a real problem. However, Abraham didn't hesitate because of all of his problems. And I, I want to encourage somebody today, don't hesitate because you have a lot of problems. Problems are a part of our walk with Christ. God is testing how we as believers will respond to problems. Abraham responded to the problem. Abraham realized that God could do anything. He could do anything but fail. And I want you to understand that brothers and sisters, that God came to Abraham as he was about to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, he came to him and said, I got a ram in the bush. And when he came and said, uh, when he had a ram in the bush, he said that uh, he called him Jehovah Jireh. In other words, he called him that the Lord will supply. 
He came at the last minute. And I want somebody to know that the Lord will come at the last minute. The Lord will supply everything you need. Don't be discouraged because God will supply. God will provide. For every promise, I want you to know as pleasant parishioners, there will be problems. I want to hammer down on that. I often talk about that in many of my sermons, but I think that's why God has called me to preach because there are so many people who have romanticized Christianity. They think it is a cakewalk in the park after you become associated with Christ. But brothers and sisters, what I want you to know that even in your problems, the Lord will supply. And I want you to understand this. Even though you have problems, don't throw in the towel. Don't give up on the ship. Don't wave the white flag of surrender. Don't hang up your harps upon the willows. Hold on to the Lord's promise even when storms are raging in your life. Hold on even when you can see what God is doing. If you hold on to God's promise, I promise you this, God will provide. That's why my lar laryngitis ain't clearing up because I'm, I'm just getting into this this sermon. Uh, I, I, let me pause parenthetically to share with you a particular story. In 1989, a severe earthquake almost flattened uh, a place uh, off the coast of Argentina. Uh, a, a deadly tremor killed about 30,000 people in less uh, than four minutes. Uh, in the midst of all of this confusion of that earthquake, a father rushed in to his son's school. When he arrived, he discovered that uh, the building was flat as a pancake, standing there uh, looking at what was left of the school. The father rem remembered and promised his son that he would always be there to take care of him. No matter what was going on, he said, I will take care of you. Tears began to roll down his eyes. It looked like things were hopeless. It looked like, brothers and sisters, uh, his promise was futile. Remembering this, brothers and sisters, his son's classroom was on the corner of the building in the back. He began to go to search for his son. He began to search for his son and the record records, brothers and sisters, that he searched for his son for a long time. He searched for his son for about 12 hours and then 12 hours turned into 24 hours. 24 hours turned into 36 hours and finally at the 30th eighth hour, he pulled back a boulder and he could hear his son's voice and his son's voice called out to him. A voice answered to him, dad. And he said, uh, it is me. Then the boy added that these priceless words. He says, I told the other kids not to worry and I told them that you were alive and you would come for me. And when you save me, then they'd be saved. You promised, Dad, that no matter what uh, you said, I'll always be there for you, brothers and sisters. All I'm trying to get somebody to understand is that we have a father that is coming for us no matter what we've gone through, no matter what has fallen on us. We have a dad who promises us that he will deliver us. No matter how bad your storm is, I want to suggest to you pleasant parishioners and partners of PG to rely on God's promise. For we have a father who always makes good 
on God's promise. Uh, brothers and sisters, I also want to share with you to rely on his presence. Rely on the Lord's presence. Rely on the Lord's presence. Not only must we rely on his promise, but we must rely on the Lord's presence. In verse 36, Mark records, uh, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he and other little boats were with him. Y'all walk with me here. What I'm trying to say is, brothers and sisters, there were other boats on the Sea of Galilee that day, but the presence of Jesus Christ was marked and it marked the difference between uh, the disciples' boats and the other boats. All they would ever need and all they uh, would ever need to handle the storm was right there in the boat with them. And I want you to understand, <laughs> although there were a lot of little boats on the sea, I want you to understand that you have Jesus in your boat and Jesus can help you uh, to make it through the storm. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you already uh, have and you, uh, you already have everything you need. You have everything you need and you have everything that you will need in Jesus Christ to handle all storms. When the storms began to rage, some of you and some of us look to external friends. Some of us look to family. Some of us, brothers and sisters, look to our internal ability. Some of us look to education. Some of us look to our own know-how only to discover that there are some storms in life that we are not equipped to handle. Thus, it's time for us to stop looking for our external partnerships and external prowess and fix our eyes instead on the eternal presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. Jesus is Lord, even in the storm. And he can and God will handle our storms. I know this is written for us to be uh, present together, but I got to continue to preach this word. If you just hold on with me for a minute, I'll be done. But the writer of Hebrews quoted Jesus saying that I will never leave you nor forsake you. The word never is a double negative. It means never, ever. Never, ever is the idea of when Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The word never, again, is a double negative. The Greek, uh, in the Greek, it is a promise uh, with emphasis on I will never leave you. One writer says it like this, for he himself has said his statement on record, I will not and I will not cease to sustain and uphold you. With Jesus on board, there is no storm that you cannot handle. I want to encourage you today that there is no storm, and I'm preaching to myself, there is no, along with you, as, along with preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself, there is no storm that you cannot handle. God's presence makes a difference in our lives. Brothers and sisters, there is no storm that we can not handle. We're moving on, but the last piece that I would like to share with you is 
uh, that in your storm, uh, God will be right there. Even though uh, we may not feel his presence, God is there. You may not know he is right there, but he's ready to deliver you from all situations that you cannot handle. Lastly, brothers and sisters, rely on his power. We want to rely, first of all, on God's promise. We want to rely on God's presence. But we also finally want to rely on God's power. Rely on God's power. Let's look at verse 39. Then he arose. He rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, <laughs> be still. The word rebuke is the same word Jesus uses in Mark 5 to silence demons. Rebuke literally means sit down. When he says, peace be still, the translation is be muzzled or in 21st century colloquial language, shut up. He tells the wind to sit down and he tells the sea to shut up. Jesus says to the elements that we experience in life to sit down and shut up. I'm blessed by this power and that I've experienced these terms before. I remember as a young child, my mom used to tell me to sit down and shut up. And I'm thankful that the Lord has this same power that mom had over me back then. He has that same power over all the elements of life. He can tell the storm to sit down and shut up. Brothers and sisters, he has the power to tell sickness to sit down and shut up. He has the power to tell um, disagreement, sit down and shut up. Brothers and sisters, I share with you is that he spoke to the wind and the wind as it moved across the face of the deep. He had the power, and this is not the first time he's had the power, but he had the power, if you all can reflect upon when the Lord first spoke. He has power to speak to the winds, and they began to move. He spoke to the waters, and they began to separate from the land. He had already proven that he had the power because he spoke to the wind and the waves and they sat down and shut up. Likewise, there, no matter what we face in life, because the Lord knows his children and because we are children of God, God has the power to tell our issues to sit down and shut up. Notice that the power is in the words of God. He spoke and the storm ceased. With just a word, the Lord can steal your storm. He can make your storm be at peace. With just a word, the Lord can turn your life around. With just a word, the Lord can bless you. With just a word, the Lord can move and can turn your pain into praise because the power is in God's word. Perhaps the disciples were living in fear because they had forgotten what they had already seen Jesus do. If we just take a little walk back through those particular verses or scriptures or gospels, we see uh, in chapter one of Mark's gospel, 
With just a word, he cast out an unclean spirit. With just a word, he healed a leper. In chapter 2, with just a word, he healed a man who was paralyzed. And in chapter 3, with just a word, he healed a man with a withered hand. By the time they got to chapter 4, they should have known that Jesus could have handled a storm just by his word. You can look down the hallway of your own history and heritage. Would I promise you would see that God has already demonstrated God's power in your life. God has already proven that he can handle your storm. You can be in a storm. And you understand that God moves on your behalf and you become a storm survivor and you become a storm survivor only if you choose to live in faith and not fear. Brothers and sisters, you've got to understand the Lord's promises. You've got to live on the Lord's promises. You've got to expect and know and respect God's presence. And brothers and sisters, you've got to rely on God's power. I'm reminded of how the old saints used to sing out. I've been through the storm and rain, but I made it. I've had heartache and pain, but I made it. I've been down to my last dime, but the Lord stepped in right on time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I made it. Brothers and sisters, the virtual door of God's house is open. The virtual door of God's house is open. If you would like to become a part of Pleasant Green or the church at large, um, there are a few ways that you can do it. Brothers and sisters, you can send a, an email to ghpruitt at gmail.com, ghpruitt at gmail.com. You can leave us uh, an email there or you can call into the church office at 314-535-7548 and you can leave us a voicemail. And if you leave a message at either place or on either platform, we will respond to you as soon as possible because we want you to have a lasting relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you, brothers and sisters. The door of the church is open. Also, we bless God for all of those who may be guests on our virtual streaming today. We bless God. We, we pray uh, uh, for those who are guests. Uh, we pray for those who are guests and we're thankful for you coming. Also, brothers and sisters, we want to remind you or uh, first of all, we're thankful for your generosity. We're thankful for your generosity. We thank you for your faithfulness in generosity. And for those of you who would like to start a life of generosity, I'll share with you how to do it. We are reminded of what scripture says in Proverbs 3 and 9. Proverbs 3 and 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits uh, of your crop or the first fruits of your income. Brothers and sisters, and you can do that like this through the Ministry of Pleasant Green. You can send a check or a money order to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church at 1220, 1220 REV GH Pruitt Place, REV GH Pruitt Place, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113. You can send a check or a money order, or brothers and sisters, uh, if you're technologically savvy, you can log on to our website at www.pgmbcstl.org uh, and you can click on our giving tab 
and there you can give electronically. We are thankful for your continued faithfulness in giving. We are thankful for you, brothers and sisters, and we also want to just stay uh, in prayer uh, for all of our pleasant parishioners and partners of PG and the church at large uh, as we uh, continue to um, provide the best leadership possible for our church. Uh, that being said, brothers and sisters, I pray that this has been meaningful. I pray that this has been inspirational. I pray that you have gotten some encouragement out of this, and I pray that this also has been uh, a worship service that is evoking, evoking you to live a life that is um, purposeful in the life, uh, in the sight of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. With that being said, brothers and sisters, we want to pause for a word of benediction. We want to pause for a word of benediction. We want to pause for a word of benediction. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your providence. We thank you for peace. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your promises. And we thank you for your power. God, have mercy upon us tonight or today, rather. And God, we ask that you uh, lead us to where you'd have us to go. And Lord God, we ask that you uh, help us to understand uh, how uh, we are to carry out your word uh, in our own individual lives. God, we pray uh, that we uh, are pleasing in your sight. God, we ask that you have mercy upon those who are sick, those who are bereaved, those who are struggling, those who feel forgotten about. Lord God, help them to know that you, they are loved and they are yours. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of God's glory with exceedingly joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Let us all say together, pleasant parishioners and partners of PG, amen, amen, amen. Look forward to engaging with you soon.